Okay. Love it. Thank you. Okay. This is probably the most important lecture <laughs> of the whole course. It took me years to get on top of that myself. So I, I, I appreciate that this is a bit of a run through. Again, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff we have to cover. Um, but we'll come back over the next 10 weeks, well, over your, 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 your life as audiologist, um, to some of these concepts. Um, the concepts actually are the, 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 the absolute threshold. That's a bit of a um, definition. And then the concept of auditory filters and masking. That's what we're all dealing with. What is actually masking and how do our, our ears work to make sense out <coughs> of the sound? Right. What is an absolute threshold? Well, it's the, the d definition that I give you now. An absolute threshold is a threshold for which I have given a good definition. Okay? So, can we make sure it's recording? say again? Can we make sure it's recording? Yes, that is recording now. Mm -hmm. I have made sure. Just to just double, triple check here, it's recording. Okay. Um, absolute thresholds are thresholds with a good definition. Okay? Th there is no thing as an absolute threshold. As you hopefully understand now, depends on the way that I measure it. But imagine that we have a good definition. I don't know what the definition actually is. I want to make clear that it depends still on a number of factors. Not only the persons and the decision criteria, even if I take that away, the method. It still, for example, depends um, on the duration of the sound. Because the longer a sound is, the, the more chances I get to hear it effectively. That's what's physiologically behind that. If I have a 10 millisecond sound, a very short sound bit, I get a 10 dB higher threshold than if it's a second long. So another choice that we have to make if we do PPA, what kind of, of, of length of the tone we actually want. If we make it too long, like four seconds, it goes up again. Why? Because people lose concentration. We just had that in an energy project last year. We're not measuring th tones, we're measuring something else. Um, but th they get worse again if you give them too much time. So there's an optimum somewhere. How do we measure it? Well, there's two ways of measuring it um, by definition. Um, and they're called, the, well, there's in industrial norms now that I've explained to you, two DINs, in industrial norms, um, for absolute threshold and quiet. And if I, well, first thing you need to, to, to also appreciate, if you listen with two ears, you are better than with one ear. Why? Because maybe, but even without that, you just get two opportunities to listen. So you get two chances to listen. So even if you're guessing, or just about guessing, you have one on the left, one on the right, and you just need to listen or to hear it with one to hear it. So you're better. Um, but assuming symmetric monoral absolute threshold, we get two ways of measuring um, the threshold or the, um, the effect of the frequency, namely in a sound field and in a microphone at the ear canal. One is called minimum audible field and the other one is minimum audible pressure and both are it's important to understand. First of all, the, the MAF, <coughs> minimum audible field, is the situation you're sitting in a soundproof room. The meter in front of you is a loudspeaker and plays the sound through your closed ears uh, and you get no reflections from the side. It's an isolated room and because we don't want to do that, um, well, we want to measure that without the people here. We want to define that. We are doing the same situation with the microphone. And then we measure what the p person, wh what they define as a threshold. And then we replace it with the microphone and measure the sound pressure level at the microphone. That gives us the defined MAF curve, ISL, International Standard Organization 226, 2003. How that has been defined, we talked a little bit in the, in the, um, in the tutorials, that this is a kind of a threshold, this is a very much of an ideal idealization, but this is the threshold that we, that we see and look as the hearing threshold of humans. Because it's depending on the, not depending, it's, it's according to the international standard organization, so if you do an experiment, you will be well advised to use this as your zero dB, okay, as the hearing level. A lot of your zero dB. We'll come to that in a second. Okay, that is actually so important that um, so relevant that people, um, when you measure sound, 
is with the microphone with the sound level meter and you measure low frequency um, obviously the thresholds are much higher and high frequencies obviously thresholds are well inaudible but we want to have a measure that we say applies to every person and gives some kind of rating of loudness a loudness is not the same as sound pressure level yeah I, I hope that everybody understands that I can have a lot of sound pressure level at 100, 100 kilohertz but it has no loudness whatsoever so the correlation between the the definition of what has been done acoustically to get them into um, into uh, under control is a filter an a weighted filter that's why we always say dba so spl if something is 20 db dba I'm sure you all use it all the time that's what it means it means that the, the, the sound pressure meter the sound level meter applies just this filter yeah? this should be the inverse of our hearing threshold but it is just a very rough estimate of that the, the reason for that is uh, that it's not that easy to, to uh, produce sound level, no, to produce filters. These days it is easy with digital technology, but with traditional analog technology it wasn't easy. And so they just defined there's this kind of um, half curve that we can very easily generate electronically. And that's what gives us the DBA weighting, which everywhere is used for the measure of loudness. If you look into your specification of your washing machine or your dishwasher or your car or in fact on the side outside of this this building here it tells you what the level of, of, of background noise or the level of your dishwasher is it tells you dba yeah yeah if the filter and the device measures 100 decibel at let's say 100 hertz then it would reduce that by 30 decibel because that's a, a, a approximately what the hearing threshold of a human is at that hertz. Okay, yeah? Works to it works to sound. approximate the physical sound level to perceptional sound loudness. Good point. We're not because you're not studying acoustics. I'll leave you off with that. Just just Google it if you like. There are different curves. B has not the the high frequency, and C is I can't actually remember myself. Yeah, I can't I can't remember. But they they are slightly different. And the the dBA. I mean, I challenge you. Have you ever seen a dBc measure anywhere in real life? Yeah, you have. Rarely. Usually it's the A weighting. Uh, th the point that I, I'm not going into detail with here because you can criticize us all you want. This is not perfect, but that's the one that is used everywhere if we measure loudness. Okay, but that was the minimum audible field. What's the other option of measuring loudness? Well, we take a person. We're not using a loudspeaker, but we're using headphones. You obviously do very often, but they and and. Um, and we measure what, 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 what frequency they have at a specific threshold, and then we put a little microphone into their eardrum. So we're not measuring the field inside the room, how loud it is, but the pressure just at the eardrum. <coughs> yeah? Also a valid measure. Both of these are valid measures, but they measure slightly different things. Because this is very much related to this person here. Well, you can measure it for many, many people. Um, but what's the biggest difference? Well, this only has one ear. The other one has two ears. So that makes one difference. Um, but there's another difference. Oh, yeah. Because when we can do that, we have to take away the human, like what we did. In we take the human out and replace it with a microphone. Here we take the, the human out and we replace it with a coupler. They're called the two CC couplers. You should have heard that which is basically the simplest um, 2 cc stands for 2 cubic centimeters and that's the average volume of the ear canal so that produces the same kind of or similar kind of um, reflections or, or, or standing waves in there okay now if you measure that that that's the mass force uh, that we already saw and the red one is the mass minimum audible pressure 
and you can see the map is always higher than the map sounds funny that's the case uh, why for example well wh 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 where do the differences come from a number of reasons the first one is binaural in the in the free field you've got two years here you only got one year um, if you um, occlusion noises means you have the, 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 the resonances in the ear canal that you can make use of which you can't make use of with the for the, for the, for the pressure this is explains especially this difference at 4k and all sorts of other things what types of earphones and whatnot there is but that's the the um, also a standard definition that is important to know um, because the clinical implication of that is that the the audiogram that we're using is based on the on the map and not on the map I explained <laughs> that in the tutorial wrong it's actually based on the unilateral ear pressure because we want to define it in a way that is independent of loudspeaker of headphone or whatnot it should only relate to the pressure at the eardrum <coughs> okay so we usually push over that and say, yeah, the threshold is the one that we measure in free field, but that's not the case. There have been a number of steps in between to actually define our, that we recognize as the audiogram, the zero line, is actually our the pressure and not the free field level. Okay, so what is a dBHL? It's on the pressure, one ear earphone coupler, and this is how it is um, the, the called the reference equivalent threshold SPL, red SPL, and the red SPL is the zero curve. So for example, in relation to the red SPL, 40 dB hearing level means how many decibel? It's 40 decibel. That's where it comes from. Okay. Right, here we leave the, the realms of acoustics and the definitions that is uh, important for you to, 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 to realize, to have heard at least one. Uh, in, in real life, you won't need all of that, or many of that, but it's good to have, to, to, to un have a rough understanding of that, of course. Yes? Can I understand the difference between the reference and the differential? Where sort of the number that you're using is less than the number of the reference? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, that's what we have the couplers for to reference not, not, not only the machine audiometry but also the, the hearing aids and stuff I always choose to see couplers to get this red SPL the, the reference equivalent threshold SPL that's the def definition of the threshold that we're talking about that's why they're called absolute thresholds because they are an absolute definition in that okay yeah yes that's right and I actually explained it wrong in my tutorial because I once you know that, you kind of forget about it again. Because somebody in 1978 defined that, and we're using it now, but it's useful to understand obviously where it comes from. Okay, and now to something completely different, namely the mask threshold. What happens if there isn't a clear sound just without noise? Right, obviously, usually we have sound. So here's a typical report from a hearing aid user. I can hear fine. They're sitting in front of the television at home but as soon as there is background noise they struggle and um, particularly bad if noise is low pitch or rumbling so it has low frequency we're going to understand why that is the case and on the way there we explain or we, we find out about the term auditory filters which is as a pretty much at the heart of everything that we're doing you can understand the, 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 the ear from a number of concepts. You can understand it or try to understand it from physiology, so there's a basilar membrane motion. Uh, you can understand it from thresholds, but it all comes together at this term of auditory filters because we have a very good explanation psychophysically and a very good explanation physiologically. And today we're talking about the psychophysical definition of what they are for that we need to understand what masking actually is. What is masking? The first terminology, we have usually a signal and we, we in, the, in, in the easiest case that's just a pure tone um, but in the real world we never talk about real pure tones. 
we talk about the, the, the stalker, for example, stalker in Neuss. So the, the signal can be anything that we define to be the signal. It could be there are experiments where you have a speaker there and you have a speaker there. That's the signal, that's the, the, the noise. They could be the other way around. You want to measure how much you concentrate on this speaker and that one is the noise. So just to, to clarify that, noise doesn't mean white noise. Noise can be anything that you, that you don't want it to have. And target or signal can be anything that you do want to hear. Okay? So master and noise are not the same things. Good. So, what's the standard setup? We have well, one person, one ear, we have a signal and we have a masker. Signal and noise. It's called ipsilateral masking. And we can have, well, we can have ipsilateral masking, we have bilateral masking. We can have simultaneous masking. What else can we have? non-simultaneous masking <laughs> um, but we're concentrating here on ipsilateral simultaneous masking standard and we actually say that the noise is noise <laughs> so white noise or band pass filtered noise and our stimulus is a pure tone just for simplicity okay so this would be let's say just a hypothetical threshold over frequency so this is i don't know 100 hertz to 8 kilohertz and we talk about one tone in the middle now and we would have to make the sound about this loud to hear it. Okay, let's say normal person, this amplitude would be zero decibel, doesn't matter. That's the tone. That's a frequency representation of the tone, and it's above the threshold, whatever the threshold is, but we say we have an absolute threshold here. So would you hear it or not? Yes, you would hear it. Good. Now, I'm making an experiment. This is my representation of noise. Have you seen something like that? That is a spectral representation of noise. What does it mean? It's not a sound, not one pure tone, but it's a broad, broad band. It's not broad band, it has not all the frequency. It just has some of the frequencies. It's called a band pass filter noise. I'm sure you've heard that in, in, in warble tones and stuff like that. That sounds, um, it, that is used in, 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 in uh, some experiments and some clinical applications as well. Um, if you don't know how band pass filter sounds sound, Oh, I'll play you some later on, actually. But yeah, you follow me, what that means. It has a certain level, SPL level, and a certain bandwidth. Yeah, if you don't understand that, you will not understand the next following slide. So I guess we have that. So what happens? Oh, would you hear that? <laughs> yes, because it's above the noise. Now, would you hear that? So we make the noise, keep it same bandwidth, but make it louder. No. That's masking, okay? That's the simplest form of masking. We kind of swamp the signal. Signal is in here, and then the, the noise just cancels it out. Visually, it cancels it kind of, but acoustically, it will cancel it as well. Well, at some level, it will cancel it as well. Okay. Um, that's what's called on-frequency masking. On-frequency means that the master is at the same frequency, well, it covers that frequency. In fact, we'll discover later off-frequency masking, where the master can be somewhere else. But, uh, well, very interesting case. And we need to make the, um, the, the, the masker, well, X decibel, louder than the, than the signal. X actually, yeah, okay. So, um, yes. Um, I need to go into that. How much is this X actually? Now here's something fascinating about the ear. You can make the, how many decibel would that be? Would it be that a positive SNR or a negative SNR? Repeat our definition of SNR. What does SNR stand for? <laughs> signal to noise ratio. So it's got a signal and it's got a noise. So here the noise is louder. So this is a negative SNR. Let's say this is minus one or something. The actual threshold that you would discover in a case like that is negative. The ear is very clever. It can detect the signal even at slightly negative SNRs. Question is how much, if, if it's too loud, it will go beyond. But usually minus two, minus three decibels, so where the noise is actually louder than the signal, it's perfectly all right for a normal listening session. So we might be able to hear that. But if we make it too loud, and we come to that in a second, we now want to find out when this masking happens. First, the definition of masking, and I say that because there are two definitions of masking. Um, well, there's one definition of masking, but it, it covers two concepts, namely the process 
by which the threshold for one child is raised to the presence of another, and the amount by which the threshold for one child is raised to the presence of another. These are identical sentences apart from the words process and amount. What can it tell us about auditory processing? So just remember that masking does, is, is, is two things. You can use it as a, as a concept of, yeah, there is a masking happening, or you say there's a masking of 12 decibels. Okay, let's do our experiment here again. What would happen to the tone threshold if we increase the energy in noise? We said this is just a setup. So here, we just hear the sound in there, but now we raise the noise level, or we make the noise smaller. These are the two options that we have. Good. Let's say we make it 10 dB louder. Do you hear that or not? Well, if we raise the sound, well, how much? No. Go back. Let's assume this is the level at which we just about hear the sound. Okay? Which is just not covered. That's the threshold of our sound. And now we make this, the, the noise 10 dB louder. Now, now we do an experiment. How much do you need to make the signal louder to hear it again? 10 dB, 10 dB the same level. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay? This is a linear system in the sense that it's the same here as it is up there. But it's different below because if you, if you can't hear the sound, obviously you can, can't hear it. But, well, this is exactly what I say. Level of noise versus my threshold of the tone. That curve is what I just described. You make it 10 dB louder, you need to make the sound 10 dB louder. But if you're below a certain threshold, you just don't simply hear the sound, so you can w do whatever you want. Um, you just don't hear it. So, so the level of noise is, is kind of constant because that's the same as the, the absolute threshold. Good. So that's the onset of the on-frequency masking, and the slope we predict to be 1 dB. So you need to make a tone 1 dB louder for 1 dB more SMR. Good. So far, so linear. That's, I think, everybody kind of, 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 of agrees with. Um, boring. But what happens with the other dimension if we make the, if we change the, the, the level, no, the, the frequency of the noise? So we make the loud, the, the sound 10 dB. No, we make the sound wider in frequency and we make it thus louder. Why do we make it louder? There's a lot of, of, of stuff in there, but we make it broader, but um, we, we, we therefore cr increase the level of 10 dB, and the prediction here is that we have to make our sound 10 dB louder as well. Okay, so we make the noise louder, but not by increasing its amplitude, but by increasing its frequency. What do you think? Do we have to make it 10 dB louder to be able to hear it again? Same one to one. Let's let's think about it. Notice that's the just to explain that again. Notice that we're not stretching the same SPL over the broader range of frequencies. So we're not making the sound broader while keeping the SPL the same. We're actually making the noise louder. We put more energy into that. That's called in, in, in acoustics the spectral level. Um, we we keep the spectral level constant. So in terms of SPL, this sound has the same SPL as that sound. So the area under the rectangle is the kind of the SPL. But we c what we are doing, we're holding the dB per hertz. This is what the spectrogram measures constant. So we actually increase the SPL by making it wider. Okay? That's the, the kind of the trick here. Well, the no, it's not a trick. This is the, the, the fascinating thing. We're increasing the SPL. And the prediction, what I want to do to what you want wanted to hear basically is the prediction is the same as before you put 10 dB more masking into the, 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 the system and you need 10 dB more uh, tone to hear it the slope we still predict to be 1 dB or 1 dB per octave here I think if we make it wider for example um, but 
and here comes the big but. Everything so far is nice and linear, and every every mic uh, microphone in the world would, would 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 tell you exactly the same. But if you carry on increasing the amplitude, at some point you do not get a higher amount of mass gain, and that's what was very surprising to people. And we're talking about 1930s, 1940s. Bell Laboratories who developed the telephone. They measured all that kind of stuff because that's all the technology or the, the, the knowledge that's behind telephones, for that matter, uh, because there are filters in there and, and they needed to know all of that. And they were quite surprised to find um, that you can increase the sound level by whatever you want, effectively. You will never be able to mask a specific tone that you heard before. Although the, loud, the noise becomes louder and louder. Now, how can that be? There is a, a knee point in this curve, it's called the critical bandwidth. The critical bandwidth, below that bandwidth, the noise masks, and above this bandwidth, the noise doesn't mask. So the noise that doesn't mask is obviously dealt differently in the auditory system than the noise that does mask. And that's the point where all these, where the auditory filters come in. I've got the experiment here. I don't think we have the time to do it, and, and in this noisy environment, it probably doesn't sound very good anyway the results but I invite you to do that at home with your headphones I just give you an inclination of what it sounds we yeah that's my counting experiment okay so your job is to count how many sounds you have the sound is beep 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 which I think thousand Hertz tone and 50 means that's the bandwidth of the noise so that's very very narrow so you might find it hard to sound like a warble tone because the noise and the sound sound almost similar. But try to guess, or try to count just for that one how many. One. I certainly don't hear any more. 16? Okay, that's a reasonable answer. Let's jump a few because I don't have the whole time to do that. Let's do 200 hertz. Now you have a bit more broader noise. I lost it already. Anybody still counting? Okay, that's reasonable, good. Where am I? Okay, I jump to the next one, 800. That's pretty broadband noise already. Oops. going up again here. See, that's the, the external noise here. And the last one. That's very broadband noise. When I did that experiment with controlled, uh, controlled, well, kind of controlled, it was still a classroom, um, but in, in with headphones and stuff, this is the result that I got, plus minus error, I didn't put error bars in here, which is bad, never put a graph on anywhere without error bars, yeah, but I still do it. Um, that's 1000 hertz tone, so 
15, I think, is what, what you told me. 50 hertz, fif uh, 15 turns, less, 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 and 400, and then it kind of stayed constant from that. So that's actually experimental result, not in a classroom setting, but not too far away. Why can I actually do this? Is that a scientific experiment? I haven't calibrated anything. Obviously, the noise levels are very high. Yes, it actually is quite scientific because I don't worry about absolute thresholds here. I only worry about relative thresholds between the signal and the noise. And that I can control 100% because I give you these two. If they are up here loud or down here and low, isn't actually relevant. It's only the, r the relative uh, difference between them. And that's why this is actually a good experiment. So point is, there is a maximum um, bandwidth, about 400 hertz for that one, 1,000 hertz tones, 400 hertz, where more masking and the noise got louder. Did you hear that? that? The noise got a lot louder in the end, but it doesn't contribute to the masking. So you still have the same number of tones. If you hear you, you increase the masking, here you don't increase the masking. And that's critical threshold, a critical uh, bandwidth here is very, very, very important because that is what's called the auditory filter bandwidth. Right, so critical band, uh, that is one critical band. Uh, every frequency has a critical band. 1000 hertz has a critical band of 400 hertz. So it's like a band pass filter in which what happens, in which the noise interacts with the sound. So we've got our stimulus, 1000 hertz, that interacts with all the frequencies, so here there's our 1000 hertz tone, and that's the area, so minus, what, what, what was it, 400 hertz bandwidth, uh, so I've got from 800 hertz to 1200 hertz, roughly. These frequencies actually interact, whereas these frequencies here, do not interact. So, that's the, the, the short and the long of it. If I listen to a sound here, then all of these make a difference, and all of these do not make a difference. So there's something happening in the auditory system which is very different between this area and the green area, and that's what's called an auditory filter. So frequency outside the band do not mask, and frequencies inside this band, they do mask. What I haven't shown here is if I make that very much louder, the bandwidth would become short and smaller, a little bit. And what I also can't show you here is they, be they are actually not, not that symmetric as I indicate here, but, but they're actually a little bit broader to the high frequencies than to the low frequencies. But that's detail that comes to later, but for the time being. And um, these critical bands are roughly average by approximated by a one-third octave band. Do you recognize anybody here that makes music or mixes music? When I do this lecture for acoustical engineers, there's always people who <coughs> recognize this one-third bandwidth. Is it something to do with when you've got like, let's say, a, vol a volume control between, between every number, exactly. they want to be fairly accurate? Like a mixer. If you have a mixer, a musical mixer, they always have little knobs. Have you seen a picture of a big mixing studio? They've got hundreds of these knobs. They're exactly one third octave away from each other. And that's the reason why. Because if you, if you had smaller than one third octave, it would become, uh, they would start interacting. The one third octave is what we perce perceive to be independent of each other. So critical bandwidth of 2000 hertz and bandwidth of 400 hertz. Okay, so summary, behave, the, the ear behaves like a set of overlapping one-third octave bandpass filters. So you've got a bandpass filter around 1000 hertz, and you've got a bandpass filter around 2000 hertz, and inside the filters everything interacts, and outside of the filter it doesn't interact. So, but there's obviously not fixed, you don't have one filter at 1000 hertz, you've got an infinite number of filters, but these are actually all a third, roughly a third of an octave wide. The point why that is important, if we want to listen to a difficult situation, speaker and noise, or the sound, the, the, the pure tone in noise, we choose, we can choose with our brain which filter we're listening to. But what we cannot choose is the bandwidth of the filter, because the, the, the noise does interact or it doesn't. 
but that's the main mechanism for us to understand speech and noise because we can concentrate on specific speech fre speech frequencies and drown out all the others. Yes. Stay with me for another two slides because we will talk about it. that. What you're talking is off frequency masking. She's actually the, she's asking what happens if you have a, a high frequency tone, 8000 hertz, and you have a low frequency mask at 500 hertz. They do interact, but I need to tell you exactly why or how. Okay? Right. That's not a realistic auditory filter. That's just my, my, my simplification. Realistic ones are not rectangular as they were originally in envisaged by Fletcher. And used for telephone technology in fact but they're more rounded and they're slightly more complicated because they actually change a little bit with, with the level um, but we can we, I'll show you some figures right but in order to, to, to find out how we actually measure the exact form of these auditory filters it's obviously very important for us to understand what these auditory filters how they really look like we need to define uh, frequency resolution um, because you might think what we just did was frequency. We, we resolved one frequency in the presence of noise. Okay, so the definition of frequency resolution is the ability to detect the signal at one frequency in the presence of sound at a different frequency. It's exactly what we did. Okay? Um, but note that this is not the same as frequency discrimination, which as if you're a musician, you sometimes do these tests. You have a I play you 2000 hertz and then I play you 2060 hertz, do you hear the difference between the two? That's frequency discrimination, that's not what we're talking about, we're just talking about frequency resolution. So can you hear, pick out one sound, the 1000 hertz sound that we just heard, out of the noise? Okay, and there are two ways of measuring this frequency resolution. And if we measure frequency resolution, we measure the auditory filter. They're the same thing. And one of these is called the psychophysical tuning curves, and the other one is not noise. And I should talk you through both of these methods in, 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 in the next couple of minutes. Um, and they are, are both at the, at the, at the center of um, the research in hearing over the last 30 or 40 years, maybe. Right, first is PTC, psychophysical tuning curves. Um, ignore the auditory nerve fiber because we haven't actually talked about them yet, but maybe it gives me the opportunity. What we're talking about here is the exact equivalent of what we know auditory nerve fibers to do in the ear. So we're measuring, if we're measuring auditory filters, we measure in a pretty ingenious way the exact response of auditory nerve fibers in our ear. And the same thing, well, equivalent. But, um, It's better to have a figure and, and then explain where we're going. What we're doing, what we, what we want to know is we want to know the, the masking, the, the, all the sounds that mask our tone, our signal. Let's assume this is our signal at, I don't know, 1000 hertz, and it's just 10 dB above the, the threshold, SL subjective level. Um, so this is very, well, sensation level, this is very quiet sound. And we now don't want to put on frequency masking on here, but we have off frequency masking. So this is what you just explained. We have 8,000 hertz here, the 500 hertz here. Let's make it a little bit closer. Let's say this is 2,000 hertz. This is a span between 1,000 and 1,200 or something. Do you think that masks? Yes, at some point that will mask, exactly. Um, and if you measure that now at for this tone, then this is a typical masking curve that you get. So this uh, noise, we need to make this low. This one masks much better. This one we already had, that's the on-frequency masker, and then it goes up again. So what are these characteristics of this curve? This is the first approximation that we can do of an auditory filter. Okay, so we measure um, the, 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 the threshold for every kind of masking noise, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven measurements, seven noises that we measure the threshold for detecting this one curve. So or another way to think about that, all the sounds that are above here, so a tone here, that loud would mask this. If it's below that, it wouldn't mask that. Yeah? So 
So, what are characteristics of that? Um, it, it is asymmetric. Low frequencies are better masked gas than high frequencies. Note that if I go any kind of lower frequency, will at some point mask my tone. If I go above here, if I make it as loud as I want, it will never mask my tone. Okay, so that's asymmetric. Um, it's quite symmetric around a little bit around here, but then this this is good. Is there? So, if I measure that um, with with one person, for example, this would be kind of results. So this is our absolute threshold. These are our test frequencies: 200, 500, 1k, 2k, 4k, 8k, and these are the, the masking threshold gaps. Um, what's the advantage of that? Why do we do that? Is, is that something that is relevant beyond the esoteric research paper? What do you think? Have you ever encountered anything like that in your life as an audiologist, if you ever had one? Yes. And I should take that maybe forward. Um, what do you think the main difference between a hearing impaired person and a normal hearing person is? Is it A, the loss of thresholds, or is it B, the shape of their pulpit? <laughs> it is probably both to a degree, yes. The problem is, or the point is, if they have a loss of thresholds, which means we fix them up, we can compensate for that because we can make the signal louder. If they have a loss of <coughs> frequency resolution, I, I'm jumping through my own lectures here a little bit. Let's just take one of them, 1000 hertz. That's a normal listener and the, 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 the filter looks like that. Nice. So now I encounter a hearing impaired person, he would have a much higher threshold of a filter like that. Let's do a slide later on. What we measure with PPA is this difference. That's nice. You can compensate it with the hearing aid. But their real problem is this, the widening of the filter. And we cannot compensate for that. And why is that a problem? We'll learn over the next couple of weeks and months because that is what makes listening to speech difficult. We need a good frequency resolution in order to pick out, simplified, to pick out a specific speaker in noise. If you pick out me and you're normal, assuming you're normal listening, you can pick out with your, with your individual uh, auditory filters, you can pick out my frequency around here and all the noise around it, it doesn't matter. Yeah? You are the green curve and that frequency and that 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 they all don't contribute you will still hear that sound for the hearing impaired person because the filters are much 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 wider that's not the case if you amplify that to be as loud as we want all of these frequencies will mask by a thousand hertz and they will struggle to understand me that's the real problem of hearing impairment and that's the one that we cannot get on top of with hearing aids and as also my research program for the next 10 years. And yeah. Oh, last fun fact, but maybe we should talk about that next, next week. Uh, this, do you recognize these curves? You probably don't. Um, if I turn that curve around, how does that look like? recognize that curve it's the envelope of the movement of the basilar membrane these are the two things the same thing your basilar membrane moves and the more it moves the more it detects the sound in terms of threshold the more it moves the lower the threshold so these are the same thing that's why that's why I'm saying the physiology meets psychology in the shape of the auditory filter 
we can understand one from the other. Right, right, further, we have a bit to throw, go through. Uh, the disadvantage with that, before I stop with that, is, is there is one problem with this PTC method, uh, psychophysically tuning curve, namely, um, as we said, low frequencies can influence high frequencies. So if you have a low frequency here, it might influence the threshold over there. That's what's called off-frequency listening, and it can skew the results, especially if people are not normal, because then they have a wide range. They've got these hearing curves, and then the frequency full-on interacts, and then my curves become less reliable. But this has been used, is used in clinic, and has been used in clinic certainly before. Simplified versions of that, because they are a very nice way to determine relatively quickly people's um, thresholds, not, not thresholds, sorry, their, their, their filter shapes, and you can learn something about their actual hearing impairment. Okay, and because of that problem that is, is fast, it's like PTA, it's fast, quick, and dirty. Uh, there is a scientific equivalent of that, and that's what's called notch noise, and that's much slower, but much more reliable. And what's notch noise? Signal, um, is it, it measures the same result. It will measure my, 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 my curves, my, my hearing, um, filters, shapes, uh, but in a different way. And the logic of that is, I could explain it in, in words. We have a tone, that's the same tone as before. But now we put a notched noise around. That means we put two noises, one in the low frequencies, one in the high frequencies. And obviously, if I make the gap wide enough, I'll hear the sound. And that's what exactly I do. I change the delta F for the frequency width. Here I hear it, I hear it, I hear it, I don't hear it. So what's the notch width that I need to, to, to measure my tone? And if I change that around, I get a filter shape which looks like that. The problem if I do it like that is I can only measure symmetric filters because I, well, in, 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 the, in, the, in the way that I apply it here, um, there's a symmetric gap around there, left and right. Um, but we don't have the problem of cross-hearing because any kind of, of, of cross-effect would be buried in the noise. They, just, they, they, they cancel everything out, and the only thing that matters is really just the tone and the surrounding gap. So that has been used. It's unfortunately quite an elaborate procedure. I've done that with a hearing impaired person myself with three levels, five frequencies, um, and 15 conditions in terms of notch width took three days. <laughs> so for clinical use, not necessarily appropriate, um, but <laughs> it gives good results in a in, 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 um, in, in, in laboratory environment. Um, yes, and I, I, I skipped the, the, the equation, but the, the equation just describes this function, and this is the, the kind of summary, literature review summary over the results of what they, what they found. So that has been originally suggested by Stricker, 1961 already. Um, this is the center frequency. That's the basilar membrane rolled out logarithmically, okay? And that's the, the bandwidth. And we're talking about ERB, equivalent rectangular bandwidth. We were always talking uh, initially, remember the Fletcher experiment told us the, band, the, the, the filters are just rectangles, which is a nice summary or a nice simplification because we know the area and everything. And because it's so simple, we're still talking about equivalent rectangular bandwidth. So th that just means if I have an auditory filter um, which looks like that, then it has the equivalent area of this rectangle. Yeah? That's why we, why everybody plots this ERB, equivalent rectangular bandwidth. And what did I say? Two kilohertz, three hertz, 400 hertz. Should be. Yeah, more or less. Might have underestimated that. Okay, um, and these are actually experimental results. You see that all been done in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, and they, they fit this line pretty pretty nicely. And this line is, uh, is, is, is this one here. That's just the tip. So one herb is 24 times four times the frequency, center frequency times one. It's just a pit to the data. So there's no, no 
great depth to that, but if people measure that and that fits with line, it comes out as a kind of um, a logical. Now, where's the third octave? Do you that? Because I said the third octave is a different approximation. A third octave can be straight line straight down here. And that explains everything above 500 hertz very well. Below 500 hertz, our auditory filters actually become broader than they should be. Why is an interesting question, but there's a lot of speech sound going on below 500 hertz, with the pitch and stuff. And so the, 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 the explanation could well be that we need um, different kind of filters down there. Is that really the case? Uh, let's go back. Yeah, here. This is my, these are the measured frequencies here. We see the higher frequencies are much sharper than the lower frequencies. Okay. And now, the last five minutes, I finally explain um, the off frequency masking. And the last thing here is what's called the remote masking pattern which is basically a different kind of formulating the, the, the auditory filters and they're asymmetry um, but I do it the other way around now so I have my tone and I measure how, how much I must well, I, I can know how much I need to increase the noise at a certain bandwidth to mask my tone and that is now a thousand hertz uh, bandwidth no, thousand hertz center frequency um, and various bandwidth and what I measure is how, where, where do I should put my tone? So I ask the question the other way around. So not fixed tone, different noise, but fixed noise, different tone. Why should that give different results? Well, it shouldn't, so it's a different way of measuring it. So if I, for example, had this tone, it would be not mask. And if I change all of these tones around, I could mask, I could define an area for this noise where the tones are all masked. Okay, but so far this is just the exact equivalent of what we've done, but uh, why is that now useful? Because I can change the amplitude of the masker. So here I explore the other missing parameter, not frequency, but also the level. So we make the level louder. Here we have master levels from 20 to 90 decibels. So this is a very quiet sound. That's quite a loud sound, 90 decibels. And we observe the final missing piece of our picture here, namely the upward spread of masking. Why is uh, low frequencies uh, worse in perception or more masking in, in, in than, than, than higher frequencies? Uh, and this is a, a typical pattern. And in fact, that again is, is based on the response pattern of the basilar membrane. But the thing to take home here is very quiet sound and a very symmetrical masking. They don't mask very much above the higher frequencies. But very loud sounds don't mask the low frequencies at all, but they do mask all the higher frequencies very effectively. And now coming back to the explanation of the, 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 the hearing impaired person, especially low and rumbling sounds are troublesome. My, my personal experience is my, 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 uh, my kettle in my kitchen which is very low frequency, 50, 60, 100 hertz, and it's the best masker in the world. You just switch it on, and for the next two minutes, nobody can understand the television anymore. Uh, it's not very loud, but it's just the frequency that masks everything. Well, it's about that loud, probably, 80 decibel or something, and it masks all the higher frequencies. Whereas if I had my, uh, my kettle, and uh, it would boil at 5,000 hertz, it would be quite annoying, but it wouldn't mask anything. So low frequencies mask high frequencies, but not the other way around. And that has a, a number of implications for real life. Um, so remote masking patterns are symmetrical for low intensity, but if the masker level increases, they become asymmetrical, and they do, in fact, uh, spread upwards. That is also the reason why uh, you, you turn the music in a car so much up because the car produces very much low frequency noise and that masks very efficiently the speech and music in a radio in the car. Um, the, 
physiological basis for this remote masking pattern. And here's a very simplified version of the basilar membrane um, envelope. But from the base, here's a high frequency to the apex, here's a low frequency. Maybe I should stop two. If I have a pattern like that, let's stop two. So here's the, the, the high frequency, okay, at the base. And here's a low frequency at the apex. And this is a low frequency sound. And it has kind of this envelope, yeah? So a low frequency sound has energy everywhere here. That's the masking. That's where the masking comes from. If I have a quiet high frequency sound up here, it would be masked. Whereas if I have a high frequency sound with the basilar membrane maybe like that, it would mask all of that here, obviously, but it would not mask anything up here because it's gone by then. Yeah? So that is just purely because the sound's coming from here and it runs through the high frequencies because before it touches the low frequencies, it deposits all of the energy at the high frequencies and on the way also masks the high frequencies. Yes, practical implications. Most environmental noise is, is low frequency, like in a car. Um, cattle. Mid and high frequency signals are not immune from the low frequency noises and mid to high frequency in speech is most important for understanding and use actually you can make use of it. MP3 coding is based on that principle. MP3 coding is the, do you know, MP, yeah, perhaps you know what MP3 means. Um, MP3 reduces information in music by picking out everything that you don't hear. And how does it know that? Well, it takes exactly that approach. It knows that if there is a very loud low frequency sound, it wouldn't hear any of the high frequency stuff, so it doesn't transmit it. And thus you can reduce sound to a tenth or a hundredth of its size and not losing any of the perception. You lose all of the information, but you don't hear it. And that's why, it's, that's why MP3 stands for uh, perceptional coding. And that was this lecture for today. And don't run away, please. <laughs>